Welcome, everyone. Our speaker today is Danny Bassett, who will be telling us about science as branched flow, a case study in citation disparities. Take it away. Great, thank you. Um, I'm really excited to be with you all here today to talk about some of our work in understanding disparities or imbalances in the way that we cite the work of scholars around the world. Um, but to frame what I want to say today and the data that I want to show you, I want to begin um, with asking the question of how we do science. So when I think about how we do science, I often think about the physics of branched flow. And you can see an image of branched flow here on the left-hand side. Uh, this is a phenomenon that occurs in many irregular media where propagating waves enter this really beautiful, I think, regime that's called branched flow. It affects many different kinds of media, so from sound to light to water to matter, and over vastly different length scales. As you can imagine, what's happening in the context of light is at a much smaller length scale than what's happening um, in the context of oceans. So uh, this, this kind of phenomena occurs often and across many different systems. Why uh, do I think it's relevant here? Well, here on the left-hand side, you can see a video of these branches actively being put down by the system as a function of time. As you can see from the image or from the video, branch flow is a phenomena in wave dynamics. The waves are propagating um, and it produces this tree-like pattern that involves successive, mostly forward scattering events by smooth obstacles that deflect the rays or the waves. So, so as you, you can sort of think about um, what's happening in the oceans and small smooth obstacles that can be existing at the bottom of the ocean that can deflect the waves. The ray bending um, or refraction then leads to this characteristic structure in phase space and a non-uniform distribution in coordinate space that looks somehow universal and resemble branches in trees or in stream beds. The branches also take on these very non-obvious paths through the refracting landscape that are indirect and non-local results of the terrain that's already been traversed. So what that means is that for any given landscape, the branches will look completely different depending on the initial manifold. So why is science like branch flow? Well, I want to think a little bit of ideas as following paths, that we build one idea on a previous idea on a previous idea, and we sort of propagate those ideas forward along paths in a conceptual space. What that um, suggests then is that idea rays can be bent by the terrain of human nature or society. And then branches of thought can take on these really non-obvious paths through the idea space. Similar to the phenomenon of branch flow, that means that we might be sampling the space of discovery in a non-uniform way. So notice that the, the fact that branches exist indicate that there are spaces where there are no branches. There's sort of empty spaces in between the branches. And we can think about idea branches moving through some conceptual space with, with, with empty spots of, of unconsidered um, ideas. Lastly, I think an interesting correspondence is thinking through how branching patterns in an idea space can differ based on the terrain. So the terrain of human nature or the terrain of human society. So, can we think a little bit more concretely about what that train might look like and what would be um, the uh, idea equivalent of a smooth obstacle on the bottom of an ocean? Well, I think that we can think about our waves of inquiry as being guided into these branches that, can, that are often defined by factors of privilege. So for example, a really famous thinker, a privileged gender, an advantaged race, or a single ethnicity, a certain class, um, or some given prestige. And what that means is that there may exist large swaths of discovery space that are left unconsidered or unexamined and unknown. So to think through this uh, correspondence between branched flow and the way that we do science a little bit more concretely, I want to look at a case study of citation trails. So what do I mean by the phrase citation trails? Well, I think a little bit about the paper that I'm currently writing or, or a student paper that I'm currently revising. And in that paper, we are 
um, seeking to build an argument. And I may have an idea here that I've placed in the discussion section or in the introduction section that builds on a previous idea, which itself builds on a previous idea, which itself builds on a previous idea, and um, et cetera, back into the past. And what I'm doing in the context of the introduction or the discussion, wherever I'm argue, wherever I'm building this argument, is that I am laying down a citation trail um, that helps people to see the history of the argument and the pieces of the argument and how they fit together. Because that um, citation trail is being constructed within existing power structures and systems of oppression in the US and beyond, that means that those factors can partially determine the path that my citation trail takes. So the question for us is, can we see evidence that these structures and systems of oppression impact the citation trails, how and why and in what contexts, and can we kind of unpack some of the factors that explain why that occurs. Before we do that, I want to say um, these citation trails don't just exist in the paper I'm currently working on or the paper that you're currently working on. They also exist in textbooks at the end of chapters. They exist in proposals that we write um, for grants or other financial support for the work that we do. Basically anywhere where we lay out a line of argument that builds on previous ideas or anywhere where we recount a potentially partial history of that idea. These are places where citation trails can show up. Why is it important to study citation trails before I show you any of the data? Um, here, I wanted to mention some work from Sarah Ahmed, who notes that citations are like academic bricks. And, she, and they're academic bricks in two different ways. So in the first way, they are basic building blocks of academic careers, um, in part because they partially determine the success of the individual. They can be used, the sort of number of citations and extent of citations can be used in considerations of how much somebody is compensated at a university or a research facility. They're often discussed around the table for promotion and tenure. Um, they are also often discussed in the context of decisions regarding grants or other funding awards. Um, they are also mentioned in when people think about who to collaborate with or who to invite to give the keynote talk at the conference that they are organizing. And when I'm mentioning that citations are, and numbers of citations are used here, I'm not condoning that, um, that use. I'm just mentioning that it occurs. Um, the second way that citations can be thought of as academic bricks is that they are basic building blocks of the fields of inquiry. So these citations map out scholarly fields. When I um, when I pull a review uh, for us and, and hand it to a student and say, this is what I really want you to read before we discuss developing this new project together, that review and the citations that occur inside of it maps the scholarly field for the student. Um, so what that then by extent or extension means is that citations define a whole space of inquiry. They can often determine the scope of the questions considered or the questions that aren't considered. Um, and they offer a record of the history of a particular scientific idea. So in these two ways, citations are academic bricks. As academic bricks, the citations that we lay down or that we read can build a more diverse scientific community, or they can erect walls of exclusion. We want to understand how and why these two outcomes might occur. And we want to do that across many different fields and, and ask to what degree. To what degree are citations building a more diverse scientific community or erecting walls of exclusion? The first study that I wanted to show you is one that we led in the context of um, neuroscience, and it evaluates the um, percentage of citations that are given to people with different races and ethnicities. I'm going to sort of walk you through what this figure is showing you. On the y-axis is the percent over or under citation of a people group. On the x-axis are four people groups. In the first group, we have a uh, um, predicted white author in the first position on the paper, so the first author, and the last position on the paper, the last author. And the reason that we do this is that those are the two um, locations in neuroscience that are most important for authorship contributions. And we understand that this differs um, in different fields of study. 
On the right hand side, you can see the fourth group is it says AOC, AOC, that is author of color in the first author position and author of color in the last author position. So that means anyone who's not white. And then in these two middle groups, we have a white author in the first position and an author of color in the last position or vice versa, an author of color in the first position and a white author in the last position. In the saturated uh, colors, you see the actual data from um, over 60,000 articles in neuroscience from the top five journals in the field over the last 25 years. And then in these lighter colors, you see the expectation according to a random null model. So what we observe is that papers that are written by um, by white authors, so white in the first position, white in the last position, are oversighted by about 8%, and papers that are written by authors of color in the first and last position are undersighted by 17.2%. Um, importantly, this uh, expectation that we're comparing to is where we take a random draw um, from the literature of what papers were possible to cite. So what that means is that uh, we, we know and quantify um, in this and other papers that there are more papers out there to cite that are from white authors. So we already know that there's a skew just based on the sampling, right? But our question is, are we citing just based on that existing skew of what's available to cite? Or do we cite um, papers from white authors even more than expected or undersite papers from authors of color even more than expected based on that um, distribution? So what we find um, from this data and others throughout the paper is that reference lists tend to include more papers with a white person as first and last author than would be expected if race and ethnicity were unrelated to referencing. And we also show that this imbalance is driven largely by the practices of people like me, so white authors, um, and is increasing over time, even as the field diversifies. Now, in addition to race and ethnicity, we're also interested in asking whether similar disparities exist along other dimensions of demographic difference. One that's relatively easy to address is gender, although there are many other dimensions of difference that I would be very excited to consider um, in this and related work. So before I show you some of the data on gender, I want to um, tell you a little bit about how we do, the, how we and others um, assess gender in the data that we extract. So what we do is that we use probabilistic databases that tell us what the probability is that a person with a given first name is um, a man or a woman, either according to sex assigned at birth or according to um, uh, social media profile. So that can be the gender chosen later in life. So here, what I'm showing you is that we can categorize everybody, all of the names according to um, these two bins. Uh, in the blue here, I'm showing you names with a probability of greater than 0.7 of belonging to a woman. And then on the bottom bin, it is names with a probability 0.7 or greater of belonging to a man. And the databases that we use canvas over 177 different languages from many different countries. Um, so it's a very broad uh, multinational um, database. So we want to ask whether these groups face a citation cost or receive a citation benefit. But I also want to mention where um, gender minorities might exist within this data set and how they might be treated by our analysis methods. So it is true that trans women, for example, who may have chosen a name that is more characteristically given to a person assigned female at birth would exist in the blue bin. And it's also true that trans men, if they have chosen a name that's commonly given to an assigned male at birth child, will, belong, will be found in the orange bin. And then in the middle, there may be names that really don't have an association with a gender in that particular language. But I also want to mention that it is possible for a person of any gender to exist in either of these bins. Um, what is true of the top bin is that it could be composed of trans women, trans men, cis women or cis men, non-binary people, anybody who has a name that's commonly given to a child who's assigned female at birth. And similarly, in the orange bin, that's going to be composed of people with any, uh, uh, with any uh, gender identity that has a name commonly given to an assigned male at birth person. What that means is that they'll mostly be women in the top and mostly be men in the bottom, but there's going to be a mix of everybody. And I have a quick question, just because I'm slightly confused. Are there two bins or five bins? 
There are two bins. There are two bins. And then there's a group of people which you cannot classify and therefore you don't include them? That's or... correct. Okay, yes. thank you. Yep. Okay, so using this approach, um, a group that is, is not our group uh, wrote this really interesting paper in Nature in 2013, where they studied over 5 million research papers and review articles with 27 million authorships. And what they found is that papers with women in key authorship positions, either as the single author um, or as the first author or as the last author, are cited less than papers with men in key authorship positions. And you can see that by noticing that the red bar is lower than the blue bar in single authored papers, in papers from national collaborations, and in papers from international collaborations, whether you're the first author or the last author. Um, so this is very, very consistent. This particular data set that these authors evaluated um, co uh, collapsed over many different fields. And so one interesting question that is being asked by multiple fields is, is this true of our field or is our field um, somehow magically wonderful and different um, in being equitable? So here's a study of um, astronomy that was published in Nature Astronomy in 2017. Uh, th again, this one's not by us, where the authors along the y-axis show the measured or predicted number of citations as a function of year from 1960 to 2015. And what you can see is that there's a slow move toward the equity line, which is great. So um, these uh, groups are being cited closer and closer to what would be expected, but they do measure an average intrinsic bias of about 10%, implying that women systematically receive 10% fewer citations than would be expected if they were men given the non-gender specific properties of the papers. So I want to mention what some of these non-gender specific properties of the papers are that are being used in the statistical models or being regressed out of the data. These include um, the journal in which the paper was published. So if a paper is published in a high impact journal, it's likely re to receive many more citations than a paper that is published in a lower impact journal. So we account for the impact factor of the journal in our statistical analysis, and they did as well. Additional factors are the seniority of the first and last author, um, the location of the author's institution, um, because there is a privilege associated with different uh, geographical locations in the world. Um, whether the paper was a review article or a research article, we know based on data that review articles tend to be cited more than research articles. So we regress out that factor too. Um, and uh, we also regress out the time or account for in our statistical model, the, the date that the paper was published, understanding that a paper that was published last month will re have received fewer citations than a paper that was published several years ago. So after accounting for all of these factors, um, we can, measure, we can uh, quantify the measured or predicted number of citations for that paper. Okay, here's, in addition to astronomy, here's neuroscience. This one is from us. Um, and here along the y-axis, again, is the percent over and under citation. You can see that papers from man-man um, teams, so a man in the first author position and the last author position, are oversighted, whereas papers with a woman in the first and last position are undersighted. And the difference here is about 40%, so an undercitation of 30% for the women-women papers and about 12% um, for the man-man papers. We also noticed that this effect was most common in papers that are written by man-man teams. Um, it is less uh, prevalent in papers that are written by women teams. And it is this um, difference is growing with time um, rather than closing. And I'll show you that picture in a second. But I wanted just to mention that the effect is also true in a subfield of neuroscience known as cognitive neuroscience. So the under overcitation of the man-man teams and undercitation of women-women teams. It's also true in medicine. This one is not from us. This is a cross-sectional study of over 5,000 articles um, where they evaluated papers that have a woman as the primary and senior author, um, uh, mixed teams, and then a man primary and senior author. And what they find is that those papers that have women primary or senior authors had fewer citations than those written by men primary or senior authors. Articles written by women as both primary and senior authors had approximately half the number of citations as those authored by men as both primary and senior authors. 
this is um, the one I'm most excited about right now because it's the newest study that we've done and we were able to dig into the data. It's a much larger data set. We were able to dig into it a lot more. This is a study of modern physics. Um, so this is from over 35 uh, journals over the last 25 years. What we find again is an overcitation of the man-man teams and undercitation of the women-women teams, but we also show that it depends significantly on the subfield um, of physics. So here in gray are journals, the effects of journals that are um, general interest journals like Nature Physics or um, reviews of modern physics. Um, and other other general interest journals. In, and by contrast, these colors here are subfields. So AMO is atomic and uh, molecular, uh, uh, red is condensed matter, green is um, nuclear physics, purple is HEP, uh, orange is um, soft matter and biophysics, this teal one is nanophysics, and then in pink is astrophysics. So what you can see is that there's actually very little um, imbalance in astrophysics, and there's significantly more in AMO. But the largest uh, discrepancies exist in general physics journals. Here's another study that shows a similar effect in the field of communications. And I think the last slide I have just to show you that this happens not just in STEM fields, but elsewhere is um, papers that uh, report a similar effect in international relations, in political science and social science, and another one in international relations. So it's pretty consistently observed across a wide range of um, fields. I had mentioned earlier that the gap is widening and it's widening both in terms of race and ethnicity discrepancies and gender discrepancies or imbalances. So I wanted to show you that data. I'm gonna start on the right-hand side. So this is data from white citers, so people like me, and this is how much we cite papers in, in purple is how much we cite papers from other white, white teams. And then in orange is how much we cite papers from author of color teams. And what you can see if you just look at the purple and orange lines is that there's a growing gap over time. This gap is not uh, present if we look at how authors of color cite one another. So they are citing much closer to the equity line. But white citers in citing authors of color tend to be, seem to be um, increasingly uh, imbalanced in our citations as we move from 2009 to the present. On the left hand side, you can see something similar in the context of gender. So here, in, this is uh, the behavior of papers that are have man-man teams um, from the top five neuroscience journals over the last 25 years. And here you can see a growing um, tendency to cite papers from other man-man teams and a decreasing tendency to cite papers from woman-woman teams. So if you just look at the purple and the orange lines, you can see that they're diverging over time, which means that the gap uh, or the citation imbalance is widening. I want to put those two pieces of data together, though, now to ask the question of um, how intersectionality might be playing a role in what we are observing. Uh, so what happens when you have a paper that's written by a woman of color in the first and last author position versus a white man in the first and last author position? So we're going to combine race and ethnicity and gender uh, here. And this is specifically in neuroscience. Uh, the color here indicates the percent over or under citation, so red being oversighted and blue being undersighted. Along the y-axis is the first author's predicted race and ethnicity and gender, um, so gender is in the parentheses. And then along the x-axis is the same data but for the last author. So what you can see here is that there's a clear block diagonal structure where there's more red in the top left block, more dark blue in the bottom right block. Um, the bottom right block that is mostly dark blue, so mostly undersighted, is um, the group of papers that have a woman in the first and last author position. The block at the top left that has more reddish colors is the group of papers that have a man in the first and last position. So this block diagonal structure is explained by the predicted gender of the first and last authors. <clears throat> Sorry, can I ask a quick question? Yes. So, so do I understand it correctly that you're also predicting the race based on the uh, on the name of the author? Yes. So, I thank you for asking that because I did not um, clarify. 
we are taking both the first and last names of the authors and predicting their racial or ethnic background based on by characters. And so that is the probability with which two letters are near one another. So in different languages, there are different probabilities that two letters are near one another. And from those that distribution of probabilities, you can predict the language um, and by extension, um, the racial or ethnic heritage. Cool. The Thanks. major sure the major place where that prediction breaks down though i want to note is um in the us many people um who are are black americans um and were and their families were present during the time of slavery they were re often renamed with names that are very um anglican and so our predictions would um would often misclassify them as white. So what that means is that the discrepancies that we are observing are probably weaker than what's true because there is some muddying of the waters between those two groups in the US. Um, okay, so back to this figure, I wanted to uh, point out just the endpoints. So the group that is most undersighted are papers that are written by a first author and last author who is a black woman. And the papers that are most oversighted are papers that have a white man in the first and last position. The discrepancy is 24 to, to minus 47%, um, so over 70 percent um, percentage points different, which as you can extrapolate could have a large impact on um, the career success of uh, Black women in the field. And so that's something that I think we need to um, mark and motivates um, efforts to address the imbalances. So with that data in mind, I want to ask, what are some of the social factors that could drive these effect? What's going on? Why, why is this happening? Why is it increasing with time? Um, what might be easy ways for us to address the imbalances? So from the data, there's a couple factors that we've been able to extract. One factor is that um, the demographic distribution of how we're citing prior work in the field really hasn't changed since the demographics of 1995. So when you look at reference lists on average, their, their demographic makeup is very similar to what scientific fields looked like 25 years ago, almost 30 years ago. Um, however, that stasis is combined with a change in the demographics of our field with increasing um, hiring of people who are um, not uh, white and not men. And so our citation patterns just haven't caught up. There's a little bit of inertia or something um, holding us back in, um, in keeping up with the change in who's actually in the field. So uh, that's a very consistent effect across a different um, subfields of science now. It's just citing as if it was 1995. Even though we don't know that we're doing that, that's what it looks like from the gender proportions and the racial, racial and ethnic proportions as well. The second factor that we have observed in the data is a um, is the impact of gender imbalance in co-authorship networks. So for every art, um, author in our database, we can look at their co-authorships over the past 25 years, and we can ask, is their co-authorship network gender balanced or gender imbalanced, and by how much? And what we can see is that for those authors that have a very gender imbalanced co-authorship network, their citations, that person's citations, are also very imbalanced um, according to gender as well. So what that suggests is that um, there's a correspondence between who we are surrounding ourselves with in, in our co-authorship patterns or behaviors and what sort of comes down into our reference lists. We also note the third factor I wanted to mention that we see in the data is that there is a marked racial and ethnic segregation in co-authorship networks. So we observe that white people tend to co-author with other white people um, and people of color tend to co-author with other people of color. And that segregation in terms of race and ethnicity is actually growing um, over the last 25 years, again, despite greater field-wide collaboration. 
So what can we do about these factors that are explaining the citation disparities to some extent? I think we can do two things. One is that we can educate ourselves about the work of younger colleagues. Um, that younger crowd is going to be much more diverse um, than the older crowd. And it's also a crowd that we might not know as well. So as we um, educate ourselves about the work of younger colleagues, we will naturally be able to incorporate additional diversity into our reference lists. The second factor that I think we or, or action we can take is to consider expanding our co-authorship networks um, to people who are not of our gender or who are not of our race and ethnicity. So having a broader, more diverse co-authorship network, but also citing more outside of our co-authorship network. So we also see that people sit, tend to cite very closely within their co-authorship network. And we can do, I think, a little bit more to break outside of that and cite other groups. What other factors might explain citation disparities? This um, is a factor that we just recently observed in physics, and so now we're going back to some of the other fields to see if we see it there as well. Um, and that is that when you cite outside of your subfield, it appears that those citations are more imbalanced. So when you're citing within your subfield, in physics anyway, when people cite within their subfield, they're citing closer to the equity mark. And when they're citing outside of their subfield, they're citing farther away from the equity mark and in a more imbalanced way. There, I think that one potential explanation for this effect is that when we cite outside of our subfield, we may be depending on factors of visibility. So we hear about this person who works in this other subfield, or we cite um, a paper in a high impact journal. Those two, um, those two reasons for citing someone are influenced by factors of visibility, which themselves are influenced by um, uh, uh, processes that can be very biased uh, in the in the field at large, and so who we are aware of farther distant from our our local subfield is a small group, a small and probably privileged group, um, and not a random sample or a, a comprehensive sample of who's actually in the field. We also see that this happens when we, when uh, in physics, when authors cite papers in interdisciplinary broad interest journals. So um, when an author cites papers in uh, the reviews of modern physics or nature physics or phys rev letters, um, they will be citing typically in a way that is more imbalanced than when they cite papers in their own subfield. The second factor that we see again in physics, and now we're looking at the other fields to, to check if it exists there too, is that um, papers with shorter reference lists tend to have more imbalanced reference lists. So the shorter the, the reference list, the more imbalanced towards man-authored papers. The longer the reference list, the more balanced towards um, equ equitably canvassing the field in terms of gender. And then the third one is that we see that um, there's a correlation between the proportion of authors that are published in a journal, uh, the proportion of women authors published in a journal and how balanced the citations are. So here along the y-axis is the over or under citation of the women women teams. And along the x-axis is the fraction of papers in the journal that have women as authors. And we see a correlation here so such that um, journals that have that publish fewer papers from women also tend to have uh, more imbalanced reference lists as well. So what can we do about these factors? Um, one, addressing the top one is that we can educate ourselves before we cite far afield or before we cite generically some of these general interest um, journal articles. And that would address the, the imbalance we see when we're not citing inside of our subfield. We could also consider citing more, having longer reference lists, um, and then journals could work to publish uh, more equitably across different, many different demographic variables, not just gender, not just race and ethnicity. I will note that these suggestions at the end that I'm placing on the slides um, are hopeful that some of the factors are causal. Um, but I will note that all of the data that we have right now is correlational. So we observe some correlations between how much imbalance there is and some of the factors of who's been citing and how they're citing. Um, but we don't have any causal information yet. We don't have an intervention that, that um, changes something and then checks to see whether the imbalance goes away or is mitigated to some degree. So um, I would love to have more of those um, 
uh, interventionist uh, um, efforts, but right now these are suggestions just based on correlative data. And then the very final factor explaining citation disparities that we've observed is that papers that contain a citation diversity statement at the end near the acknowledgments um, cite really differently. So here along the y-axis is the over or under citation, again, of these four different groups. And then in the black bar is for this particular field, how much you would expect that group to be um, cited based on the last 25 years of data. And then in these little gray data points are the subset of papers that contain a citation diversity statement that has indicated that they are working to achieve diversity in their citations. And what you can see is that across all four groups, these gray data points um, contain the zero line. So that means that they are citing um, at the equity mark. For people who are interested in um, checking to see how they are doing with their reference lists, this is something that we now do for every paper that we write. Um, we have a publicly available database or, or code base called CleanBib that was developed by um, my graduate student, Dale Zoe. He's now a um, postdoc at UC Irvine, and he developed this such that you can put your bib tech in. Um, and it will spit out sort of the proportions that are currently in your reference list uh, and both in terms of race and ethnicity and in terms of gender. So we use this as sort of a check when we're writing. Are we setting, you know, close to the equity mark? Are we really far away from it? Are we doing better than we expected? Um, and it's been really helpful just to give a little bit of feedback internally to see mm, can we go back to the literature and what, what sort of groups are we missing uh, that we didn't think uh, to cite yet. So um, with that uh, data and those sort of mitigation factors in mind, I just kind of want to spend a few moments broadening back out to how I set up the talk um, so that you can see how we're thinking about how these connect and, and moving beyond just the quantitative assessments that I've shown you. So I had mentioned that ac um, citations are building blocks of academic careers. And what that means is that the citation gap that I've shown you um, and that many groups have been showing over the last many years is really about who does science and then who also gets to do science. Um, for those demographic groups that are being consistently un undersighted by almost 50%, that can have an impact on the potential success of the person, um, their compensation, their promotion and tenure, the grants and funding that they are awarded, the potential for collaborative opportunities, and their, the speaking invitations that they receive. In addition to its impact on single individuals, I think it's important to note the epistemic effects of the citation gap. Uh, because citations are building blocks for fields of inquiry, the citation gap is also about our collective trajectories through the space of discovery. Because citations map these scholarly fields and define the space of inquiry and determine the scope of questions that are being considered and record a history of scientific ideas, if we're only doing that in a way that's biased by the bodies that we've been born with, um, then we're missing out on a lot of potential idea spaces that could be helpful for discovery. Now, I am a, a computational and quantitative scientist, so I love the numbers. I love the fact that we can statistically quantify these effects, but I also want to say that it's always more than the numbers. I think a lot now about how I'm citing people in my papers. Am I writing a pretty generic sentence and then citing 10 papers at the end where the authors of color exist or where the gender minorities exist? Or am I engaging carefully with the ideas of each paper in a, in a, a fair way across all um, demographic groups? And I think that that's a, that's a perennial question, I think, for me to ask myself as I'm writing. Um, I also uh, think more and more as I'm working with students about citing equitably in all of the informal, non-quantitative ways. Um, so when I uh, retweet things on Twitter or whatever Twitter is called now, or when I send a paper by email to a student, um, or I mention a colleague's work in, to another colleague in a conversation over lunch, um, are, those, are those ways that I'm engaging with the work of my colleagues um, are, are they are they equitable ways? Are they ways that are privileging um, the the voices of marginalized scholars? And I think that helps me to ask, you know, how we can lay down kind of a, a praxis for doing science in a way 
that is more understanding of these um, generic imbalances and biases that we might have. So uh, in closing, thinking of critically about how we do science, because, because there is this nature of science acting as branched flow, where these idea paths can be bent in the terrain of human nature and human society, we can ask how we can have these branches of thought, um, not just take on non-obvious paths, um, but take on paths that are thoughtfully engaging with the work of all scholars who are in the field equitably. Um, and um, I think that that will open up a lot of new discovery spaces that hopefully um, will push forward the, the science itself, but also um, increasingly build a community among all of us um, that is inclusive, that is um, diverse, that is equitable, and that is, that is just. So with that, um, I would just say this data consistently uh, makes me question <laughs> um, the the objectivity, uh, supposed objectivity of, of human nature. Um, it, I had a student actually check my own citation patterns over the last, since I was a baby scientist starting to write papers. Um, and my before I knew about this effect, my citation patterns were more imbalanced than the average person in my field. Um, and that's not because that's not because I'm a you know extremely hard-hearted individual. Uh, it is because I didn't know, and I think many of us just don't know. And um, once we do know, then we can kind of be skeptical about the patterns that we may have imbibed um, by uh, the, the sort of milieu that we live in, and work to address it in the future. So with that, thanks so much for listening. I'd be happy to take questions. Great, thank you very much. Let's all unmute ourselves and clap for the speaker. All right, um, any questions for Danny? Uh, please feel free to unmute yourselves or put something in the chat. So, uh, so maybe to start off, I had a question about uh, this 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 branch flow. Did you find that uh, you know that that there are specific papers that that cite each other that are not very that are very gender imbalanced, and that sort of keeps going, and that perhaps there's some some critical spot where there is a very gender balanced paper, and then and then it keeps going in the equitable direction afterwards. Like, can you follow this this trend of of disparity throughout these throughout these branched citations. That's a really good. That's a really good question. Um, so we have not looked at the sort of um, two step dependence or three step dependence between uh, the citations. That everything that I've shown you so far is just taking sort of a one step snapshot. So um, that would be a really exciting, I think, additional analysis to do in a future paper. Thanks. I think perhaps related to that, like you said that in this collaboration networks, the racial segregation is growing over time. How yeah. are you measuring that? How are you seeing that? Yeah, you can um, you can just look at a, per, a single author and their predicted race and ethnicity, and you can see who they co-author with. Um, and you can see, the proportion of, or yeah, proportion of people, authors of color who co-author with other authors of color as a function of time. And the same thing with um, white individuals. And you can just see that the those co-authorship networks are becoming increasingly clustered. We actually use a, um, a clustering technique to extract how clustered they are by race and ethnicity over time. Like, I, I just wonder how much of this like uh, clustering of collaborations and whatnot it's dependent on where people are at and where they're actually working. Yeah, uh, I think that's probably the case. Um, oh, sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, no, no. It's, it, I, I just, I, I think this idea that uh, that you mentioned at the end that we cite in a very biased way is based on we cite what we know yeah. within the realm of possibilities and if so it seems it's very location dependent and i don't know how how would one tease that out 
uh, in your analysis? Yeah, uh, you can do it in two ways. Um, so one is just by including, like I said, the location of the university inside of the statistical model that we're using um, to assess whether it's be whether a group is being cited more or less than expected given their location. Um, so we do that. But the second thing that you can do is to subsample the data into single um, countries or groups of countries. So we've taken a subset of just the um, US based authors, um, just Australian based Australia based authors, just the European Union and um, the UK. And so then you can separately assess whether the um, citation imbalances that we are observing are consistent across those different groups. And it, it removes the effect of how much is the US citing um, people in the EU or people in Australia or vice versa. How much are people in Australia citing people in the US or um, elsewhere? So because that there's definitely a tendency for people in the same country to cite one another because they know one another. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I have two more questions, but I can't wait to see if somebody else <laughs> wants to ask something. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm holding my tongue. I want to jump in, but yeah. Okay, maybe maybe I'll ask. Do you do you think that there are like what would be a good practice for? I mean, okay, so so there's a problem, and it seems like the a good way to improve it would be when people become scientists. You know, whatever that means. Do you find that there's a particular, I don't know, way to educate people becoming scientists, or somehow change that path at the very beginning to ensure? More, a more equitable trajectory or something that you find is uh, has really worked well for um, the environments around you? Yeah, yeah. There are two factors that have been helpful for us. One is um, in my own research lab, just to make sure that we're constantly checking um, our papers to make sure that we're doing a decent job. Um, and most of the time, our first pass through a paper um, isn't isn't very equitable. Um, and we go back to the literature and think through it more. The second thing is that this, this data and also the tools for uh, analysis um, are now being included in, in the US, there's a, um, from the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health, there are efforts to train graduate students in responsible conduct of research. And so we can include a little module inside of the um, responsible conduct of research training to just say, you know, imbalances exist in the world in general. Um, these kinds of biases can show up in algorithms in um, things that are engineered for, for the world. They can, you know, exist in all sorts of spaces. Here's another one that you might not have thought about. And um, once students can, can see that, then they can you know, be be more aware as they move forward in their careers. That's 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 super cool. I, thinking back to my own beginning of uh, just just coming into the into the field, I had absolutely nothing like that. <laughs> yeah, <Zero. I> didn't. <laughs> even even so little on like how to be a good instructor, how to teach. Not even thinking about like you know all these uh, higher level ideas. So. Uh, yeah, that that sounds very cool, and I, yeah, I hope universities adopt this because, um, in my experience, that does not happen. And 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 maybe this is just in mathematics, but it seems like there's a really big focus on you know, not talking about these things. Yeah, yeah. So I have I have a practical question that may be useful for everybody here, even though nobody else wants to ask a question. So you mentioned this uh, CleanBIP tool by one of your ex uh, students. Yeah. So this will give you the proportions of your own big tech file, right? If I understood correctly. That's right. Yeah. But now, I I think like if one cites in an unequitable way. Most likely, or at least the first point of uh, addressing this issue is ignorance about what else is out there, right? So I think the hard question is 
where are these authors I don't know about and how can I find them? Mm -hmm. uh, do you guys know about something like this? Because I can, like, I, I could figure out where are the proportions on my big tip file for the different kinds of papers that are right. But how do I know then if those are biased respect to what's actually out there in that field? Yeah, if there's a field um, that, well, how do you know if it's biased? If one simple thing that you can do is just kind of try to get close to citing all of the groups in an equal, uh, equally. Um, but it is true that some fields have skewed demographics. And for some fields that haven't been assessed yet using these tools, we don't know the exact degree of the skew. Mm -hmm. um, you can, however, you can look at some of the fields that are that are cl close by. So physics is probably you know close by to mathematics mm -hmm. um, in terms of the the uh, current demographics, at least in terms of gender. I don't know about in terms of race and ethnicity. Um, so you can look there for somewhere to target, I guess. And then in terms of finding people, um, there are two things that you can do. One is that another one of my students developed a Google Chrome extension called Citation Transparency. And um, if you download that extension, when you're doing a search on Google Scholar, you will you can it shows you um, some of the demographic predicted demographic information of the authors, and that is kind of meant to be an awareness alert, um, so not to skip over names um, that are from women or from um, non um, non or non Anglican names, uh, but to sort of remember to to read those too. Um, so not just to click on the paper that is from John Smith, but to click on it, all of the papers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's one help, the thing that I've found really helpful and that others have too. And the second thing um, is I've been looking more recently at who are the postdocs from labs that I know or from groups that I know who may have gotten a job like last year or even within the last five years and I haven't really paid any attention. Um, mm -hmm. and so I go, you know, spend some time um, looking through the work that they have put out there recently. And that's been a way that I've found more new people. Yeah, thanks. I think I'll check out this extension. Quite curious how it works. All right, any other questions for Danny?